Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Jay Ferris with Nebraska Farm Bureau, and I'd like to welcome everyone here for our legislative and issue update webinar uh, here on the 31st day of March um, at noon. Um, today we are we have uh, Jordan Dux, who are, is our Director of National Affairs, and also Jay Rempe, our Vice President of Governmental Relations, that will be talking about some of the issues that are going on both uh, in Washington, D.C. and in at the state capitol. Uh, before we begin, just a couple of items. Uh, if you do have a question at any time throughout the presentation, uh, we would certainly ask you to ask those questions, and you can do that in one of two ways. Uh, there's a little hand button, and if you click on that, I will see that you've raised your hand. I can unmute your microphone, and you can ask that question live, where everybody can hear you, including the presenter. Um, or your other option is there is a place for you to type your question into a question box. I will see that question and I can ask that question of the presenter at that time. So either way is acceptable and please feel free to ask questions anytime throughout the presentation. Uh, but with that we're going to start uh, today with our national affairs. Uh, Mr. Rempe is down at the Capitol and they're finishing up this morning's uh, debate and discussion, so we expect him to join us here shortly, but we're going to start with uh, Jordan Dux with the National Affairs Update. It's a good All right. Perfect. Thanks, Jay. Um, yeah, we'll kind of go right into, right into things, and we'll, um, if folks have any questions, feel free to, uh, to let us know as we move forward here. Um, <clears throat> one of the big things that we've been working on uh, over the past uh, several um, over the past week, several weeks has been the uh, the budget. Uh, the uh, House and Senate both have passed a budget uh, for 2016. These budgets are non-binding. They're they're what they are is they provide kind of an, a layout of what spending will look like and where the priorities are. Um, and then it also gives the Senate an opportunity to see where we're at on maybe some amendments, uh, put some folks on record on where they're at on some issues here and there. And so that's kind of what we what we saw uh, with the with the House uh, passed budget and the Senate passed budget that passed last week. The House passed theirs on Wednesday, uh, a 3.8 trillion dollar budget uh, for 2016. It achieves uh, balance by in, in 10 years. Um, uh, a positive step, I think, if you look at the overall direction of that budget on the Senate side, uh, which passed Friday uh, morning at around four o'clock in the morning, uh, going through a number of amendments. Um, really, the, the, there were a number of, of important things that that uh, were passed as a part of that. Um, and so, like I said, it gives uh, us an idea of where maybe some some legislation could go on some issues that we've been working on, specifically on the waters of the U.S. issue, uh, an amendment that would prevent basically EPA from moving forward with that regulation that we've talked about um, for a very long time now. Um, passed by a vote of 59, uh, they, they were able to get 59 votes uh, in favor of, of re basically repealing that, uh, that rule, that regulation. Um, that's a strong number. Uh, specifically, uh, Senator Ted Cruz missed the vote on that one, so we we actually would assume that that number is would would be 60, uh, which gives us an idea that we could get a um, a WOTUS rule uh, repeal bill uh, passed the Senate um, and uh, and to the president's desk. We feel pretty good that uh, it would make it through the House without any issues. Uh, so some good bipartisan support uh, for an amendment to repeal the Waters of the U.S. issue. Uh, the greenhouse gas rule that we've talked about for a while as well, uh, maybe not as much as the waters of the U.S. rule, but the greenhouse gas rule that the EPA is moving forward with, which would um, uh, cause a lot of uh, coal fire power plants uh, to close across the country. Um, that one also was a was a an amendment that was passed. It did not hit the 60 vote threshold. Estate taxes were the same way; did not hit the the 60 votes that you'd need in order to see it through the Senate, but it did pass. Um, but probably the biggest victory here, besides the waters of the U.S. rule, was the fact that in neither the well the House. Uh, did include um, a small piece of language that talked about the agricultural committee finding cuts within the agric within agricultural programs of a billion dollars over the course of ten years. Really, not in terms of the amount of money. Really, a small amount of cuts, which was a positive step. On the Senate side, um, the positive thing is basically we had heard very clearly 
that uh, that we were going to have to be prepared to defend some crop insurance issues. Um, there were a number of amendments that were introduced that would have created uh, put a cap of uh, of fifty thousand dollars on on crop insurance payouts. Um, would have also put in a pretty strict means testing on who was eligible to receive premium subsidies through federal crop insurance, uh, and then also that would have removed the harvest price option. Uh, something that um, a majority of you out there uh, who take out federal crop insurance, 72% of farmers out there uh, have a policy that includes the harvest price option that allows you to choose between either a spring or a fall price um, for your crop insurance benefits. So um, there are also none of those amendments actually came up for a vote, uh, and no amendments came up that would strip some of the farm bill uh, program spending also. Uh, that we were concerned with. So really a positive step there. Um, I still think in general uh, that over the next several weeks, uh, several uh, months, several years, we're going to be dealing with um, uh, folks trying to reopen the farm bill. Uh, I think it's a pretty a pretty good bet that we can be expecting uh, to uh, to uh, have to battle uh, to maintain the program spending that we have to make sure that the programs that you all have signed up for for a, uh, through a five year contract are not cut prematurely. Uh, and uh, federal crop insurance, I think, would be a part of that. We're going to have to continue to work very hard uh, to try to maintain the crop insurance programs we have, even though we're anticipating or we passed a five-year farm bill. Uh, and so the next farm bill debate uh, is probably going to start very, very soon. Uh, and uh, we're still probably not done debating this farm bill either. So uh, more to come on that front. But that's kind of been the budget's kind of been one of the big things we've worked on over the past week, week and a half. Um, as a part of what you had seen earlier on uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, amendments was on estate taxes. And kind of a quick rundown, we're actually um, uh, I've got a little typo there on on a, a date there, but uh, uh, we've been dealing with um, estate taxes. Actually, there's been some movement there on a bill that would repeal estate taxes. So uh, current law is just as a rundown of uh, for you all to remember uh, the current estate tax exemption today that we very that we that Farm Bureau fought very high uh, very. Uh, strongly for is at five point four three million dollars per person. It was a five million dollar exemption indexed to inflation, and so when that passed a couple of years ago, uh, we've we've been moving upward, and so now that exemption is five point four three million. The tax rate is at forty percent of anything above that five point four. Um, 5.43 million. That's on a per person basis, uh, uh, the exemption level. So you're looking at 10.86 uh, in terms of a, of, a, of a total exemption of where things are at. The piece of legislation we've been following, H.R. Uh, 1105, would repeal the, the estate tax. Now, um, I will say uh, we are not under any uh, notion that uh, a repeal of the estate tax is possible with uh, with the with the, the the president and his opinion of that, which I just don't see the president signing an estate tax repeal bill. However, um, we have not had a full repeal vote in the House uh, for quite some time, uh, and there's a lot of new members of the House of Representatives uh, who have not taken a vote on a estate tax repeal at all. And so it's always a good idea to see where these new members are at. And so we've been pushing to try to get um, this bill, H.R. 1105, the Death Tax Repeal Act, I should say 2015 there, um, try to uh, get that um, push forward. So it passed the Ways and Means Committee uh, in the House uh, uh, on Wednesday of last week. Uh, Congressman Smith, who sits on the Ways and Means Committee, uh, was a co-sponsor of this bill, voted to advance it out of committee, um, and now it will head to the House floor. Um, Congress took a week. Uh, they are on recess here for uh, this week and then also next week, and they'll come back. I think every indication is that they're going to try to bring this bill to the floor fairly quickly uh, for a vote on the, under the full House. Uh, and so we've been uh, pushing uh, the rest of our delegation, uh, Congressman Fortenberry, Congressman Ashford, to try to see um, and secure their vote in, in support of this measure as well. Uh, I feel pretty good. I think Congressman uh, Fortenberry uh, would probably support this. Uh, Congressman Ashford's maybe a little bit more of a question, uh, given the fact that they'll probably stick to fairly close party lines on some of these things. But I can tell you that we're going to uh, uh, need some help to try to see if we can get uh, 
uh, this bill uh, through through uh, the House just a little bit. I don't, I don't I'm not too terribly worried that we'll lose, but uh, it's it's kind of like I said we haven't had a, a a vote on full repeal for a decade, so it's always good to see uh, where some of these new members are at. Over on the Senate side, as I mentioned before, there was a budget amendment that passed 54 to 46, so we saw um, some support for it. Uh, but in order to get anything through the Senate anymore, uh, you need 60 votes, uh, and so we didn't quite get there. Um, we'll have to see if that leads into other Senate action um, moving forward. Uh, I, I'm fairly doubtful that we'll maybe see, I'm sure a bill will be introduced on the Senate side. I don't know if we will see an actual uh, vote take place on that piece of legislation. We might have just had the one vote we'll get uh, through the budget process. but. Um, We'll have to see. I think what what we're trying to set up for also, besides seeing where some of these new members are at, is seeing if we can get um, a, uh, a process started to see what we can do for a piece of tax code reform legislation. Uh, and so you'll see some of these individual pieces of, of tax code brought up for a vote uh, in the House maybe some of them in the Senate as well, but I think this kind of sets the stage for a larger piece of tax code reform uh, legislation. Um, when that will happen, I don't think anyone uh, is really for sure. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily hold my breath to see what we get in terms of a larger piece of tax code reform legislation, but this all kind of sets the stage for that. And so we're, we're patiently working with both the House and the Senate to try to see if we can get a package uh, set uh, and move forward. Um, we do currently have an action alert running um, on this estate tax bill. And so uh, if you go to our website, www.nefb.org, uh, you can click on the Take Action button. And we have an action alert, like I said, up here um, for estate taxes. We'll uh, probably have um, a, uh, a thank you more so to Congressman Smith. But if you live in Congressman Fortenberry's district, uh, if you happen to be in Congressman Ashford's district uh, close to Omaha, uh, we'll definitely need some help there to try to see if we can get um, this, uh, this legislation, the repeal bill, see where, if we can get these uh, our, our other members to take a vote on full repeal in the estate taxes as well. So um, if you have a second, we'd always appreciate you taking action on trying to uh, send a message to talk about how important uh, estate tax repeal would be to, to you all. Um, moving forward, another piece of legislation that was just dropped recently, uh, just last week actually, um, uh, deals with GMOs. It's called the Safe and Accurate Food Labeling Act of 2015. It was introduced by Mr. Pompeo of Kansas and Mr. Butterfield from North Carolina. Um, this is a, a Farm Bureau supported bill that tries to take maybe a different approach to the GMO issue, the GMO labeling issue. Um, uh, an original co-sponsor of this bill actually was uh, Congressman Ashford. Um, uh, we were happy to see him uh, uh, be an original co-sponsor of the bill. Uh, but really what this bill does is try to take away this patchwork set of state regulations that uh, keep popping up in terms of GMO labeling. So you have ballot initiatives and state legislators who have passed GMO labeling legislation in states um, like, uh, like uh, I believe Vermont or Maine uh, has such a, an initiative, and they, they, they have it kind of quantified in there to where they, they only would, their legislation would only move forward if 10 or so other states would adopt similar legislation. So right now they're not necessarily in effect, but um, we are continuing to be concerned that, uh, that uh, a number of states are going to try to move forward with some piece of, of GMO labeling uh, legislation at the state level. And so what we've tried to do is take it away from the state side of things um, and avoid the patchwork of legislation and create a national program that would review um, the labeling of genetically modified foods. This is a, this is a voluntary program to establish a voluntary national label that a food would be considered non-GMO. Uh, and that program would be, would be developed under, uh, at USDA. It also has some language in there dealing with FDA uh, developing a, a standard for the claim uh, natural on products and also dealing and also puts in some new legislation with FDA uh, conducting safety reviews on on uh, uh, GMO products and some of those things. I, I want to make sure that folks understand, we, we are not supporting GMO labeling. This bill would not do that. 
We do not. We did not change our support. We are still opposed to GMO labeling. But what this bill would do is kind of take the issue away from activists and try to put it in the hands of put it kind of put it back under our control and have USDA develop a non-GMO program. So if a company wanted to voluntarily, again purely voluntary, if a company wanted to. Um, uh, create or have a, a, a GMO free label or a non GMO label on their food product, they could do so. Uh, and so we'd have a set standard as to what that would what exactly that would look like. And so we that's that's what this bill would do. Uh, I know there's a lot of folks that have questions on that, um, but I, I will say again one more time, we definitely are not supportive of GMO labeling. Uh, but we're trying to come up with new ways, different ways to try to kind of take this issue back. Um, and so this is one of the pieces of legislation that we're supportive of uh, that would hopefully do that. Um, I want to kind of uh, two more things real quick. Trade is obviously still important with uh, uh, for us. Uh, one of the big pieces of legislation we're going to be um, continuing to push for is Trade Promotion Authority, TPA, or um, a little slang term is Fast Track Authority is something that we, uh, that's that some folks call it. It's needed. Uh, what it does, it allows the president uh, to negotiate free trade agreements, and those free trade agreements are brought to the House or the Senate for just a simple up or down vote. Uh, they cannot be amended by, by members of the House and the Senate, and the reason that's important is that most countries won't, in, won't even negotiate with the United States if the President does not have this authority. And you know the issue comes down to um, when you negotiate a free trade agreement, you're working on these things for for years, most likely, and you finally come to an agreement, and all of a sudden it goes before Congress, and you can have you know 535 folks in the House and the Senate that can amend that, and so then you're back and forth on the negotiating table over and over and over again. This bill allows. Um, uh, basically, the president to to negotiate it and bring it to the House and Senate uh, for a vote. The House and Senate have the opportunity to see the agreement as it's being draft as it's being drafted as negotiations are moving forward. That is all something that um, that is all free and clear uh, for House and senators to see, for House members and senators to see. It's just a matter of the vote itself uh, would just be an up or down vote. It, it's an important thing uh, to try to get these possible free trade agreements moving forward. Uh, uh, the two free to trade agreements uh, that we've mentioned before uh, that we're still pushing for, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, um, 11 uh, uh, Pacific Rim countries, including Japan. Uh, really, these countries, um, mostly, uh, when you look at them, uh, of who they are with Canada, Japan, um, Mexico, the U.S., uh, this is nearly 40% of the world's total GDP, the total world's economy, uh, and under this free trade agreement. And obviously, the U.S. and Japan are the most important parts of that. Um, and uh, trying to negotiate through and trying to have Japan and the U.S. work through some of the agricultural issues that we have um, are going to be important. And so that's kind of the main one we're pushing for right now. Uh, and then the second one uh, is TTIP, or the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership. It's between the U.S. and the EU. Um, it's a, obviously an important one as well. Uh, the big hang-ups here are mostly agricultural, um, biotechnology, uh, geographic indicators, uh, which basically means um, if you have champagne, for something to be labeled champagne, it needs to come from the Champagne region of France, uh, just like um, tequila is produced in the tequila region of Mexico. A lot of cheeses are uh, labeled as to where they come from. Uh, these are very important to uh, European countries. Uh, we view these as a trade distorting, uh, and so we're trying to work through some of those issues a little bit, and then some identification issues when it comes to meat products and vegetable products and some of those. So. Um, TPP is probably a, a lot more realistic in terms of a more immediate issue. Uh, TP, uh, TTIP is something we're still working on, but those are obviously very important. Quite frankly, folks, these are both big wins for agriculture. Um, free trade agreements are normally big wins for agriculture, uh, and I think uh, just clearly um, when you try to put the U.S. on an even playing field with these countries, it's going to be important, and it's going to be beneficial to, uh, to all farmers and ranchers. So um, those are what we're working on on the trade side side of things, and then kind of the, to sum things up or to kind of conclude here, Farm Bill implementation real quick, we're still working through this. Um, the, uh, the Secretary announced an additional extension of sign-up 
uh, to April 7th. You now have till April 7th to sign up. Uh, just a few more days, obviously. Um, if you haven't had a chance to make your appointment, or if you have and you're still, uh, it'll be after that date. Uh, just real quick, some five things to remember. We ran through this last time I was a part of one of these updates. Um, but uh, just some things, if you haven't done your Farm Bill implementations or your Farm Bill sign up yet, or if you have and you still have questions, you can always call us. But uh, just some five things real quick. Yield updates are normally a good thing, not always. Just make sure you run your numbers um, and see what your yield update numbers would be versus your county, your county countercyclical yield. Um, number two, don't always assume that updating your base is a good idea. Um, corn is normally king. Uh, and so trying to maintain corn base is important uh, most of the time. And if updating your base causes you to lose some corn base, it may not be, like I said, automatically a good idea to, to update that. Um, on terms of the, uh, the uh, programs themselves, Arc County, uh, it'll pay early the first two years, possibly three, um, and it'll likely pay fairly well during those first few years, especially for corn, uh, possibly soybeans, it just kind of depends. Um, however, it, uh, it does not pay, most likely, depending upon where prices are at, but there's a good chance it won't pay on years uh, three, four, and five, especially four and five. Uh, and so be prepared on that one. It's more of your bullish price option if you think that prices will eventually go up. Our county seems to be a, a direction a lot of folks are going, kind of a, a take the money and run type of situation. The PLC program, the price loss program, remember it only pays if prices decrease from where they're at or, or roughly stay low, more of your bearish option. PLC tends to be far more popular uh, on the wheat side of things. Um, it's, uh, it's just a, a little bit of a different program. Obviously, it, it deals with prices versus uh, revenue. Uh, and so um, just remember that if corn stays um, at, uh, corn would need to go below uh, a 370 in order for you to receive a payment. And so that's, that's how that program works on the corn side. Soybeans, um, there's a set price there as well. The last thing, um, it's probably not worth your time. Uh, worrying about the ARC individual program unless you really, really want to dig into the program. It's unbelievably complicated. I think sign up for the program is going to be very, very small um, unless you're, you're very unique compared to where the rest of your county averages are at. Um, it's probably not worth your time digging into the program too much uh, unless, of course, you, like I said, you really, really want to dig into the nuts and bolts of it. It's just not written for Nebraska. Uh, it was mostly written for wheat fields, uh, big, you know, uh, massive fields in, in uh, the Dakotas, in, uh, in um, uh, uh, Montana. Just not really an overly popular program. Just really isn't something I think that will play very well in Nebraska. So that's kind of a quick rundown for me. Um, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions on the federal issues I talked about or anything else you have a question on on the federal side. Yeah, well, thank you, Jordan. Uh, once again, if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand. I can unmute your microphone. If you have a microphone on your computer, we can do it that way. Or you can also type a question into the question box, and we can ask that question directly to Jordan. Not seeing any questions come up at this time, uh, but... Uh, Jordan, you're going to stick stick on the call, I believe, on the webinar. I am. Okay. Yep. So if any do come up, we will uh, have you answer those. Maybe somebody will think of something as we go along. And I think uh, Jay Rempe has joined us. Jay, are you there? I am, Jay. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Good, good. Well, thanks, everybody, for uh, joining uh, today. I, I apologize for jumping on a little late. Uh, things were happening at the Capitol that uh, took me, uh, delayed me for a little bit. So I appreciate everyone joining. Uh, what I'll try to do, I put these slides together yesterday morning. Uh, unfortunately, it's things uh, often do. Things change a lot. But we'll run through the slides, and I'll try to uh, tell you a little bit what, what's changed or what's happening in terms of both property taxes and some of the livestock issues we're working on. So, Jay, if you want to move to the, to the next slide. Uh, real quick, I just where we're at in the session, uh, today is day 55 of a 90-day session. Just last week, senators went to a full day of uh, sessions uh, on the floor. They're done with hearings now, so they are 
uh, working at about four or five in, in the evening. They have not started late night sessions yet. They, uh, as we get closer to, to uh, probably in May, they'll start looking at uh, some late night sessions. Uh, the goal in, in April is to try to chew through as many of the priority bills as they can. Every senator can designate a priority bill, plus each committee uh, is, um, uh, can designate a priority bill as well. And so they're going to try to get through as many of those priority bills as they can, and then they'll turn their focus to budget in May. The, the Appropriations Committee needs to report out its budget recommendations in late April. Uh, and then the body, they have to do it by day 70, and then the body is supposed to have a budget passed by day 80. And so that's what the focus will turn to uh, then. That, and frankly, that's the only thing the body needs to do is, is adopt a budget for the state. That's the only thing they're constitutionally required to do. So they'll, they'll do that, start turning to that in May. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about a couple of issues that, that Farm Bureau is working on. Uh, I put up property tax relief question mark. Uh, I, in, uh, in all seriousness, I, I, I never thought I'd be sitting here at day 55 reporting to you wondering whether or not this body would be doing something in the way of property tax relief, but that, that's where we're at right now. Uh, the Revenue Committee has reported out one bill. It's a LB 259. Uh, it is a committee priority bill, and it, in its amended form with the committee amendment, it would exempt the first $15,000 of personal property from taxation. And uh, it, it was amended down to uh, the original cost of, of it with a $25,000 exemption was $41 million. They, they amended it to reduce the cost to the state to $25 million. That, the, that would be the cost to the state to reimburse local governments for the lost revenues that, that from that. That's the estimating. We did some quick back of the envelope figuring and calculated that uh, if you, the statewide average levy on, on ag property is about a dollar thirty two per hundred dollars value uh, if you if you take that look at the fifteen thousand dollar exemption you're looking roughly about two hundred dollars per savings of savings for each farmer and rancher that would have at least fifteen thousand dollars of personal property on the tax rolls that is the only thing that is out of the revenue committee in, in the way of property tax relief right now uh, Jay you can go ahead to the next next slide Uh, the other issue that's still alive at the present time is uh, Appropriations Committee. In their preliminary budget that they reported out in February, they included a $45 million increase in the, in the program. The program right now is at 100, I'm sorry, $140 million. Uh, so if they uh, include $45 million in the, uh, in the uh, budget, that would be about $185 million total. Uh, we were told last week that uh, by some Appropriations Committee members that if nothing comes out of the Revenue Committee in the way of further property tax relief, they're going to look seriously at bumping that up to $60 million, which is what we've been lobbying for and, and seeking. $60 million is consistent with the budget that the Governor, Governor Ricketts has submitted. That would take the, uh, the total up to $200 million. Uh, to figure out roughly what, what agriculture gets out of that program, uh, it's roughly about 40% of the dollars contributed, dedicated to that program go to agriculture in, in the way of a direct credit to, uh, to the taxpayer. So uh, there's some hope for, for increasing uh, that. Uh, right now it looks like it'll be at least $45 million and, and we're hoping for more. So that's a bit of a positive move there. Then in the Education Committee, uh, there were a lot of bills introduced that dealt with state aid school and school funding. A lot of senators uh, believe that, that ultimately that's the long-term answer to uh, the funding or property tax issue. But right now, there's no agreement whatsoever on, on how to move forward uh, on it. Uh, Senator Sullivan spoke uh, this morning at a meeting I was at, and she commented that there are five freshman senators on the Education Committee, and uh, they, they don't know what they don't know yet. <laughs> and so that's one of the difficulties that we're facing in this discussion. And so if anything comes out of the Education Committee, it will likely be some kind of a proposal to put together a committee or a commission to study it and come bring back recommendations to the legislature on ways to, to improve. Uh, state aid. Um, Jay, if you want to go to the next one. 
there there's still a lot of discussions going on behind the scenes and um, it, it changes from day to day on whether or not uh, what's involved in those discussions and what they're trying to package together. Uh, I, it should be, I, I typed that wrong, but LB350, Senator Brosh's bill, which she prioritized, which reduces ag lands down to 75 to 65, is still in play in those discussions. Uh, at times it's being discussed, it's being packaged with uh, some provisions out of Senator Sullivan's bill, LB 521, uh, which, which included some state aid changes to provide a, uh, a per student state aid to each student or each school district across the state. Uh, they were going to fund that with uh, capture 20 or I'm sorry 10 percent of the income taxes that are collected with each in school district and, and then use that to do the per student aid. That's not a 10 percent income tax increase. It's just capturing what's already collected. And the idea of that would be to hold harmless some school districts that, uh, that uh, the drop in values that you'd see from 75 to 65. The other part that's in there that's being discussed is uh, the income Senator Smith's bill to reduce income tax rates, uh, uh, maybe trying to package uh, a reduction in ag land values with with a uh, income tax. But uh, right now, the the education or the, I'm sorry, the revenue committee doesn't seem to be gelling around any any ideas at all. Uh, they it, 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 each day is a little different in terms of what what they talk about as part of it. Uh, we're hoping that we're expecting in, in April. The, uh, and maybe next week or the week after, the Revenue Department will be releasing its new valuation numbers. Uh, I'm sad to report, but I, I, it likely will say that the ag land is going to go back up double digit again. And uh, we're hoping maybe that we can use that as some pressure to continue to press upon senators that, that we need property tax relief. Farm Bureau continues to work on, uh, I guess we have three goals. One is the 75 to 65 as a, as a start. We recognize that's not the only answer, but that would help turn the ship around. The additional money to the property tax credit program, and then in the long term, uh, some kind of reform of, of school funding to get to the per student aid and those kind of things. And so that, that is still our, our, uh, our talking points. But we continue to express an openness with senators that we're willing to uh, to continue whatever any discussions that, that we can have to provide property tax relief we want to be a part of. Uh, it's it's again it's very dynamic it's very fluid I I'm not sure what what will happen there so Jay if you want to move to the next one oh I got ahead of myself a little bit so that's that's what we're we're trying to do. We're trying to come up, the board met last week, and, and the charge they gave to us was try to get the best property tax reduction package that you can, and, uh, and then let's keep working on the long term of, of what we can do to, to reform school funding. Uh, we we kind of seem to be caught in this box right now, uh, uh, a no man's land, if you will, in terms of uh, property tax reductions. We're being criticized that the 75 to 65 and the property tax credit doesn't do enough, uh, that we need to do more, and, and we certainly recognize that and, and say that's not the only answer, but we've got to start somewhere, and these are first two steps that we can take to start down the road to, to property tax relief. Uh, so we're, we're getting charged on one side that it doesn't do enough, that we, uh, but then on the other side we're getting hit up while that we're going to leave our local governments and our schools and, and others. Uh, without the adequate funding they need by dropping the value. So we're, we're kind of getting hit on, on both sides, and, uh, but there doesn't seem to be any, any effort right now to try to, to uh, sit down and, and try to pull those two opposing thoughts together, uh, at least amongst senators at this point. So, uh, and then the other dynamic that's involved is the Appropriations Committee has said that there's roughly about 40 to $50 million to work with for tax relief, uh, where that personal property tax, that's $25 million, so where do you where do you come up with some of the other monies to try to do some things? Um, and, and senators feel confined by that. So um, it, it's something that, that we're constantly working on daily down here at the Capitol, but uh, at this point I wish I had better news to report back to you, and, 
And all I can say is, uh, if uh, please keep talking to your senators and keep impressing upon them the need for uh, for property tax relief, and, and uh, we'll continue to try to to move the ball forward in some respects. All right, Jay, the next one. Um, the reason I was held up this morning was this bill right here is LB 106. Um, it, it's kind of it's an interesting bill in, in the sense of uh, how it's playing out on the floor. Uh, it was the LB 106 is a work group uh, or a product of a work group that Farm Bureau was a part of with the Cattlemen and Dairy Association and pork producers with NACO, the county officials, and the idea. Of, of the product is to try to uh, uh, balance local control with our need to try to grow our livestock industry. Uh, from a livestock side, it, uh, what we're trying to do is, is have the Department of Ag, if the bill were to pass, create a matrix which could be used then by the count, which would be required to be used by the counties as they evaluate uh, livestock siting proposals and, and to tr try to brew provide or bring some fact-based objective criteria to the discussion. And from our standpoint, it would have provided a little more certainty to a livestock operator and going through the process. Uh, and it would have provided some uniformity across the, uh, the, uh, the state. From a county standpoint, it would have provided uh, some information, a basis for them to make an evaluation of the, of the uh, uh, livestock operation, it could have potentially led to some more economic growth and a bigger tax base in, in some rural counties. And uh, hope would have the the idea was to try to take some of the motion out of some of these uh, local decisions in terms of livestock. Uh, the bill has been debated the last two days on the floor. Um, we are it's being opposed by Farmers Union, Center for Rural Affairs, and Humane Society of the United States, uh, and then. There are some county officials that, that uh, uh, at least on the original version of the bill, felt it would take away some local control. Uh, we've been working to try to address those concerns, but unfortunately, I think the, the perception is out there that we're, we're trying to take away local control. And so the bill's gotten bogged down in controversy. And now Senator Chambers jumped into it this morning. And, and there's a full-scale filibuster against the bill. Uh, it um, uh, and and Senator Chambers is being helped by uh, unfortunately some rural senators uh, Dave Schnorr of Dodge County, uh, John Keene uh, of Menden area, and Dave Bloomfield are are working to try to to uh, to kill the bill this year as well too. They they what they want to do is is take a step back and study the issue further and, and then try to move forward next year. And uh, generally, that, that means that uh, they just don't want the issue addressed. Uh, so as we broke for lunch today, they were still debating. We, there was a motion to bracket. Uh, they didn't take a motion on or vote on that. Now there's a motion to recommit it to committee. Again, those are, are dilatory motions to try to, to filibuster the bill. And this afternoon, they're going to a gas tax. And uh, so uh, we'll have to see. Uh, whether we, how we choose to try to move forward on this. Where I'd couch the body right now is they probably don't have enough votes to kill the bill, but on the other side, we don't have enough votes to uh, to advance the bill. So uh, we're kind of we're kind of stuck there, and we'll have to try to figure out what the best move forward. Jay, if you could go to the next one. Okay. Slide. Um, what we're I waiting. I had a couple slides in here, just kind of talking a little bit of. Oh, yep. Yep, we do have a question here going back to some of the um, budget and uh, property tax relief, if you're ready right. for that one. Okay. Uh, yeah. The question is, senators uh, do not seem to see that there's relief in what the governor says by reducing costs of government and by holding down increases as a way to give property tax relief. Um, it makes sense, but... Uh, but the senators seem, no one as far as senators seems to be talking about this. What are what are our thoughts concerning this? Well, that's always been part of our our thought process as well in, in a couple different veins. One is, if you look on average, the state revenues grow uh, over the past 20, 25 years, uh, as far back as I've seen the data anyway, state revenue growth averages around 5% over time. 
And the thought is, uh, if you can control that spending and keep it, I think the governor's budget proposal was 3.1 percent. Uh, then, then you have some some revenues that you can work with. Uh, the difference there between three and five percent that you can maybe do some things with property tax relief, or obviously there's some interest in other kinds of tax relief as well, particularly on the income tax side. So at the state level, there's there uh, that that's the idea. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I think there's some there's a there's a sense that the that that is a good thing to try to do. But in reality, when when you have a lot of different uh, groups coming in and wanting dollars for various projects and various programs and things, uh, it gets a lot harder to do. But but uh, that's something we've always been uh, interested in doing. And then on the local level, particularly too, uh, we we're strongly interested in ways that we can can uh, see, slow the spending growth and and get the local government officials to, to look at trying to prioritize spending in a way to, to reduce the growth in property taxes is always something that, that we've been interested in and uh, we've promoted as, as well. Okay. Another one. And since there, you're, Any other questions, Jay? Yeah, another question. Well, this is more of a comment, and since you're talking about 106, I'll go ahead and tell you this comment, and then you can continue on. But mm -hmm. the, it just says, thank you okay. for your work with LB-106. Passage of this bill is critical to economic development in rural Nebraska. So Okay. Well, I, I appreciate the comments. That's where that we feel. I'll just run real quick. I know there's been a lot of confusion about uh, how 106 would compare to the current process. This is a chart that we prepared that Senator Watermeyer handed out yesterday to, uh, to senators on the floor. And it just kind of runs through real quick the, the how things would change under uh, 106 versus the current process. I'll just point out, a, a, you can see it's largely the same. There's just a couple differences. One is uh, under 106 that, that it would have the Department of Agriculture develop uniform permit application forms that would be used across the state. So if you, no matter what county a livestock producer is, is trying to, to apply for a permit, it's the same application form, so you provide some uniformity there. And then uh, the other difference is that the county would score the application using the matrix that would be developed by the Department of Ag. You can see right below that, the county decides whether to approve or deny a permit. Nothing changes under uh, LB 106. It's ultimately still the county's decision. Uh, the one, one other difference is that under 106, right today, Counties can place some uh, inconsistent, what we call inconsistent conditions on on uh, livestock operations as you move from county to county. They they can require some monitoring wells, uh, some different fees and surcharges and things like that. Uh, 106 would would uh, prohibit that. It, you've got to grade the livestock operation on its application and vote up or down on on that, and you can't put any of those kind of conditions on it. So. And the last difference is that the bill would allow it with amendments, uh, a mediation process, if if uh, if the livestock producer and the county wanted to try to go to through a mediation process to work through their their differences. So that basically is only three three differences between what's happening today and 106. Unfortunately, again, that misery information has gotten spread out the countryside that that, that takes away local control. Let me, Jay, I'll, I'll flip through the next few slides real quick, just a, a little background of, of why we, what brought us to this point of why we're doing. There's some charts that look at uh, the, the livestock numbers in the state. So, Jay, if you want to flip to the next one. There, there you can see uh, a little bit of the uh, what's happened in the market hog inventories over the last uh, 10 years. This is from 03 to 2013, and we got this from AFAN. You can see Nebraska is barely growing, about 3% over that time period, whereas Iowa and Kansas and Minnesota are growing more rapidly. Uh, Jay, could you go to the next one? Here's the dairy cow inventory. Oops, went a little too far, but the dairy cow inventory, uh, It uh, you can see Nebraska has actually shrunk We over the same time period. Uh, Iowa has basically stayed the same and Missouri, but South Dakota, Kansas, Colorado all growing. And then, Jay, go to the next one. In egg production, same thing. We're shrinking while the other states are growing. 
And uh, so those are three areas. Now, I, I will say we heard it on the floor this morning. We're the number one beef state uh, in beef. We're holding our own. We're doing well there. Uh, but uh, these other industry sectors, we're, we're not doing quite as well. And so uh, that's part of the reason why the bill 106 was brought and some of the other bills that, that on livestock that I'll talk about in just a moment is because of what we're seeing, the trends, and, uh, and zoning isn't the only reason for that and, and some of the permit uh, struggles that we're having at the local level, but it's one of the factors that, that uh, we've identified that is contributing to those trends and, and we'd like to try to correct. Um, so if uh, Jay, why don't we go to the next one and I'll talk real quick about two of the other livestock bills that are, that are out there. Both have been prioritized that uh, again are, are some factors that we think are in play in terms of contributing to those trends. One, in the hog industry, Nebraska has a prohibition against uh, any, any uh, company that has a, a slaughter or a kill operation or a packing operation within the state that exceeds 150,000 head cannot own, uh, cannot own livestock in this state. Uh, ironically, somebody, a, a packer that doesn't have a facility in this state could own livestock in the state. But uh, the, the prohibition only applies to packers that have facilities in the state. Uh, uh, other states like Iowa and some of the others I brought up earlier do not have that prohibition. So what we're seeing is some opportunities that are presenting themselves in other states where packers are working with local producers to the local producer puts up the, uh, under contract situations where the producer puts up the building and they and they, uh, they feed the hogs where but the packer retains ownership and so uh, we're seeing that's contributing some of the growth in the other states in uh, Nebraska that's not occurring and so the this bill would remove that uh, uh, that restriction I guess in Nebraska and allow for some more opportunities in in, uh, in swine feeding. The other bill is uh, LB-175. It, again, it's been prioritized. It's, uh, it's uh, been introduced a couple times before, but it's a, a little different way to try to build upon the Livestock Friendly County program that, uh, and Jay can correct me here, but I think we have 29 counties that have, that have gone through the process and been designated Livestock Friendly. What this would do would provide grants to those counties and say, uh, good job for being Livestock Friendly. Uh, here's some dollars that you could use if you want to develop a marketing program, some marketing strategies, some economic growth programs to try to attract livestock to your county, or if you have a possibility of, of some livestock development in your county, but you have some infrastructure needs, like uh, you need to put in uh, a new bridge or something, or you need to widen a, 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 a turn lane or something on a, on a highway or a county road. Uh, this would provide some assistance for that. The other part of the bill, there are some incentives in place already, some tax credits in place for investment in livestock operations. Those were put in several years ago. Uh, the bill tries to update those and, and reflect the, the modern uh, or the, the current uh, cost, if you will, of investing in a, in a livestock operation and, and what it takes to do that and, uh, and uh, uh, increase the, the tax credits uh, accordingly. So those are two bills out there. They're likely to be heard over the next couple of weeks and, and we'll see what happens. Um, Jay, if go. Let me just touch real quick on uh, a couple other bills that <laughs> that we have an interest in this afternoon. As a matter of fact, the senators are going to take up LB 610. It was introduced by Senator Smith, who's chair of the Transportation Committee, and it was prioritized by Senator Friesen. Uh, it would uh, phase in a six cent gas tax increase uh, on, on on motor fuels. The dollars would be split between the cities, counties, and the state, and it's to go towards road and bridge construction and maintenance. And it kind of came out of the study that was done by senators last fall on uh, the county bridge issue in the state. Uh, there are 11,000 county bridges, and they're roughly, I forget what the percentage is, but uh, there's quite a, quite a number of them, a significant percentage of them are on the list for uh, they need work, they need problems, and they have restrictions on them, either weight restrictions or they've been closed or, or otherwise some kind of restriction. Uh, so this kind of came out of that as a way to, uh, to try to uh, direct some dollar, dollars to address that situation. And of course, cities and the state also have some needs in the way of road construction and, and, and maintenance, so they would get some of the dollars as well. Uh, Farm Bureau has policy that supports the gas tax increase if it's deemed, if it's warranted by the, by the legislature, and so we we have told senators that we're supportive of this measure if they think it's necessary. There's kind of a pattern around the state 
or I'm sorry, around the country, a lot of states are, are increasing their gas tax right now. Iowa just put in a 10 cent increase. My understanding is Wyoming put in one. And it's kind of a reflection of the federal government not doing anything on, on infrastructure development and funding. And so the states are kind of stepping up and doing it. The last bill I'll mention real quick, it was, it was talked on the floor yesterday and did advance to select file, uh, which is the second bill. But there's a bill that makes some changes to the grain dealer law. Right now, uh, grain dealers have to be bonded in this state and licensed and bonded. And uh, they, they're uh, making some changes to it that would make sure that those bonds apply only to the farmers that sell the grain off the farm, the first sale of that grain off the farm. And it would not uh, offer protection to, uh, to merchandisers in the sense that uh, like a ConAgra or ADM or somebody like that that purchases the grain and then turns around and resells it, that they, they would not be protected under. So it, it, in, uh, it would add some more protection to farmers out there. And so it was a bill that was suggested by the Public Service Commission. And uh, it seems to be moving forward through the process and, and looks like it's got a good chance of being passed this year. So, so Jay, with, uh, with that, I, uh, I'll kind of see if there's any other questions on, on any of those or any other bills that, that uh, you might have an interest in. Yeah, once again, if you do have any questions, feel free to type those in the question box or even in the chat box, or you can raise your hand and we can unmute your microphone. I'm not seeing any questions at this time come through, but we can um, give just a couple of minutes. A couple of things that I will... Uh, point out, um, as mentioned, Jordan mentioned an action alert up on a national issue. Uh, we do have three current action alerts up right now that uh, would uh, encourage you to go on and uh, fill those out. Um, happens to be on uh, the livestock growth bills, the property taxes, and then also on the uh, estate taxes. Uh, we will probably be having some more as uh, we move forward. Also, just uh, to let you know, we are planning on another uh, couple of events throughout the state next week on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, we'll be in Wahoo for breakfast Monday morning, and we're going to be talking some legislative update, mostly property tax relief on what we can, what we're doing, and uh, things that you can help us out with. Uh, but again, we'll be in Wahoo on Monday morning. We'll be in West Point for lunch. Uh, we'll be in. Norfolk for supper on Monday, and then on Tuesday morning, uh, we'll, we'll start out in Valentine for breakfast, work our way back and be in Ord for lunch, and then uh, finish off in Columbus for supper that evening. So if uh, check your emails. Some of those have not all gone out yet, but they will be going out today. Um, we'd like to have RSVP so we know how many people to plan for, but please bring a friend, um, non-Farm Bureau member, to find out what we're doing uh, that's benefiting them as well, too. So those are a couple things that are coming up that we wanted to make you aware of, too. Um, but I'm not seeing any other questions at this point. So I think we will thank everybody for jumping on today. Um, and uh, please let us know. If you do have any questions, feel free to contact any of us here uh, at the Farm Bureau office, um, either by phone or email. Um, you know, Jay, do you have any final comments or Jordan? No, I... I, I... Jay, I'm sorry, I, I yep. wasn't sure whether I was muted or not. No, I just thank you, everyone, for participating. If you think of any questions after we're done, please don't hesitate to give us a call. That's what we're here for. And, and uh, again, encourage folks to uh, continue talking to their senators about the need for property tax relief because uh, I, I think they need to understand that uh, they can't wait another year, that something's got to start yet this session to, to start down the path towards relief. So if uh, you get the chance, please talk to your senator about it. Very good. Uh, again, thank you for joining us today. Um, if you missed any part of this, we will put this up on our YouTube site uh, later on today or first thing tomorrow. Uh, we did record it, so feel free to come back and watch it as often as you would like. Um, and then our next webinar we're planning for is in two weeks. 
which I believe will be April 14th, which is a Tuesday, and we're going to be doing that one in the evening. So uh, watch your emails for that and register for that one as well, too. So with that, hopefully everyone uh, goes out and enjoys the rest of the day and has a wonderful afternoon. So thanks so much.